Inga. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. It's Easter. Um, I did want to start out that I am not a natural born speaker, so I apologize if I stammer and stutter. I probably will, especially if I look up. Um, and I am really excited for today. I actually think this is a really good little sermon thing. I hope that it puts in your mind uh, the fullness of the Bible because, at least in my experience, a lot of people believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament as totally different books, and it's hard for us to put them together, but I think that this sermon will help you a little bit, hopefully, put them together. So um, we do have Bible study every Monday night, usually every Monday night, sometimes a Thursday night, but most Monday nights we have Bible study at 7 o'clock. That is on Zoom, and anybody can join. Um, and um, obviously it's Easter today, so we are celebrating the resurrection. I hope that you are visiting with someone, and you can share the love to Jesus with them because Easter has become really a general holiday that everybody celebrates, whether they're Christian or not. So I hope that you can politely and lovingly share a little bit about Jesus with them. So we are going to do the Lord's Supper here pretty soon. So if you'll grab your cup and your wafer. I wanted to go over John 17, 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked towards the heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Christ Jesus, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So, anybody who ever tells you that the, the Bible never proclaims that Jesus is God, I mean, that verse says about three separate times that Jesus is God, right? Um, so, think about how Jesus, God, sacrificed his son himself to die for us. Father, I pray for myself, God. I pray that any glory from this sermon would go to you, God, that I would not stammer over my words as much, God, that you give me peace. God, I thank you for everything you've done for us. I thank you for dying on the cross for us, God. God, we thank you for being God and being perfect, powerful, God, and giving us free will to choose between good and evil, God. Because without being able to choose between good and evil, we couldn't have chosen you, God. That would have been forced upon us, God. So we thank you that those who have, cho have chosen have chosen correctly. So God, as we take this bread, we remember the son that you gave up for us. And as we take the cup, we remember the blood that was spilled. Father, the Bible says that without the resurrection, our belief is to be pitied. We are to be pitied as Christians. Luckily, we have the resurrection, God, and we can look forward to our salvation. Amen. So, today, the sermon is called The Serpent Throughout Generations. That'll make sense in a second, okay? Genesis 3.15 is going to be our focal verse that we will say multiple times throughout this sermon. And that verse reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So the Old Testament begins with God's creation of the world and the sin of our first parents. It was a terrible day when Satan led Adam and Eve to disobey God. But even on that day when humanity became corrupt and subject to death, 
God's made a promise which sparked hope in humanity and struck terror into Satan. The promise that set in motion the drama of all the rest of the Old Testament and of the Bible. God's people longing to give birth to the promised Savior and the serpent eager to destroy the promised offspring before the child could destroy him. The Lord said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring would be at war. There's much more to the statement than the fact that women don't like snakes. It is unlikely that Adam and Eve knew fully what the devil spoke through the snake. But they knew that something terrible had been behind the snake's words. It may also be unlikely that Adam and Eve knew the full details about the promised seed, how Jesus would eventually defeat Satan. And they may not know exactly what would have happened to them, but they had a promise from God, and they can hold on to that promise by faith. We can trace this in the book of Genesis and throughout the Bible of Genesis 15, 315, the first great statement of the gospel and the conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Adam and Eve knew, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. She may have thought that this was the seed of the woman who would defeat the serpent. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Cain, as we all know, would eventually rise up against his brother Abel and kill him. So you see that Cain, though in one sense is the seed of the woman, in reality is the seed of the serpent. He was a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning. The Bible says, do not be like Cain who murdered his brother. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Scripture says we should not be like Cain who was of the evil one. He was the seed of the serpent and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, when the world hates you. There is a great conflict between the seed of the woman who has given us God's seed and the seed of the serpent who are the ungodly. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. Irad fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methuselah, who was the oldest man who ever lived, of course. Methuselah fathered Lamech. So we're several generations from Cain now in the line of the serpent offspring and Lamech took two wives. And he said this, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's revenge, my revenge, is 77-fold. Lamech does what he wants. He takes two wives when you're only supposed to have one. Remember, this is very early on. He kills somebody who only slightly wounds him. He is going beyond the wickedness of Cain. But then we read about the godly offspring. Adam knew his wife again, and they bore a son named Seth. Eve said, God has appointed me another offspring instead of Abel because Cain killed him. To Seth, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So you have the Cain line, and you have the Seth and Enosh line. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them. When Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after the image of God and named him Seth. Okay, and then Seth, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, all the way down to Noah. Now, when you read the book of Genesis, we call it the Genesis, meaning beginnings, but actually, in Hebrew, the, the title is Toledot. Okay, in Hebrew, it's called Toledot. And I did not say this just to sound smart. It actually means generations. Genesis in Hebrew means generations. It is the book of generations. And again and again and again, go read in Genesis, you'll read the book of generations. Whether it's of Adam or Noah or Cain or whomever, You have these genealogies, these generations, and in all the generations, remember what's going on. The offspring of the woman 
and of the promise and offspring of the serpent who opposed the woman and wants to destroy the child of promise. I hope for you, for those of you who have read the Bible, maybe that even helps a little. It, it certainly did me. I mean, I, I've been through seminary and we heard that idea before, but now that I did my study, I, I think of it a little bit, it comes to mind a little bit easier. You can see it throughout, especially if you've read the entire Bible, you can see it throughout the timeline. As we look at this, I want you to notice three things. One is that there is an unchanging gospel given already in Genesis 3.15. From the very beginning, God gave the gospel of salvation, and it has always been through faith in God's promise of a victorious offspring. Second thing to notice as we get, begin to think about this is that God has an intergenerational plan. His salvation plan stretches throughout history from generation to generation. This explains why we see quite a few genealogies in the Bible, more than we want to read and more than we'd want to study. Genealogies to us are about as exciting as reading the Bible, or uh, reading a dictionary, read the Bible. <laughs> reading a dictionary, and maybe we don't need to read carefully and scrutinize and memorize every word of those genealogies, but it sends one signal. God has an intergenerational plan that goes from generation to generation to generation. And third, there is continual warfare throughout the Bible and throughout history, past the Bible. Something that runs throughout the whole Old Testament and comes to a head in the New Testament and then continues in the lives of God's people. Satan and his offspring tried to destroy the woman's offspring by exterminating, that is, by wiping out or by adulterating, by corrupting and making them mingle with them and turning them into the serpent offspring. First of all, the unchanging gospel. Notice what it says in the New Testament about the gospel. Know then that it is those who have faith who are the sons of Abraham, right? We are the spiritual offspring. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all nations be blessed, right? Not just the nation of Israel. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say, and to his offsprings, referring to many, but simply referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. I'm emphasizing this because notice that what God said in Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between your offspring and her offspring, singular. And that can refer to lots of people who are loyal to the devil and others who have come from the woman who are loyal to God, but there's also a particular focus on the offspring who is the focus of all that promise. The unchanging gospel is that there is one particular offspring promised to Adam and Eve, promised to Abraham, and promised to others throughout the Bible. There is one particular offspring that is going to be the key of it all, the fulfillment of God's promises. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that offspring. He is the fulfillment of that promise. Secondly, having seen that the gospel has always been there in at least seed form, quite literally in the seed form, of the offspring form. Second thing I want you to notice is that God has an intergenerational plan for offspring. In Genesis, you read about Adam's offspring and about Seth's offspring, and it keeps going on that God's promises have given to a particular offspring. We know that it's going to come from Adam and Eve to start with, then it's not going to be in Cain's line, but particularly in Seth's offspring, right? Then it's going to be in Noah's offspring, of course. And not those who are wicked who perish in the flood. And then one particular son of Noah, Shem, it's going to be his offspring. Then Abraham has given a very specific promise to your offspring. Isaac, Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, received the promise that all the offspring of the world will be blessed through him. It's not just the offspring. Israel is so special Though it is, but that Jesus, that particular offspring, is coming, and through him all nations will be blessed. And then of the one son, Jacob, Judah is identified on whose offspring the ruling one will be. Notice Judah. The scepter will never depart from Judah, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. And if you ask Jewish people um, you know, throughout history, Judah was so important because the Bible says that Judah is the one where the Messiah will come from, right? And as we have seen 
in the fulfillment of the New Testament, a lot of people believe that the political power will be with Judah, but it's simply talking about Jesus after the second coming. That is when Judah will never fall. The scepter will never depart from Judah, and him and to him the, shall be the obedience of all people. So all people will obey Jesus Christ in the end. So as you start chapter Gen Genesis chapter 3, you have the offspring of Adam and Eve, and by the time you get to the end of Jesus, or, sorry, the end of Genesis, thousands of years have passed, and we are focusing on Judah in particular. And then we read further in the Old Testament, David is given the promise that his offspring will be the one whom God has promised to bring salvation to the nations and to rule Israel. When you get to the culmination of the intergenerational plan, you open your New Testament, and what do you get? A genealogy, right? We open Matthew, first book, genealogy. The birth, the, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. God always had an intergenerational plan in mind, and he fulfilled it when he brought Jesus. Luke also gives us the genealogy. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son who was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli. And then it goes through a lot of generations, the son of David, through some more generations, the son of Abraham, through some more generations, the son of Sen, the son of Noah, some more generations, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, Adam and the son of God. The son of God, the second Adam, fulfills God's intergenerational plan that the offspring of the woman who came to destroy the seed of the serpent. I want to take a pause here because I was listening to a lot of sermons this week trying to get ready for this. And one thing that really stands out to me here is that um, there are those who believe that Adam and Eve were purely a story. It was just a story to help us understand what happened at the beginning. But when the Bible says that Jesus is the last Adam, right, and it talks about these generations, if that's all just a story that was made up to help us understand, that means that it, it undermines the idea that Jesus is the last Adam. He's not really the last Adam. He's just a story, right? And so whether or not you believe in evolution, and evolution can absolutely accept the idea that there was a first man and woman, of course, um, we should believe that Adam and Eve were real people who really lived. I, I, I don't want to be condemning of anything, but believing that God is real and believing that Adam and Eve were not real people, that it's just a silly story, is weird to me. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If you have faith in God, why would you believe that's just a story when Jesus also says, I am the last Adam? Anyways, think about that. And in that promise, of course, it's not just a gospel promise. It is not just intergenerational. It's a promise that there's going to be conflict. There's enmity, there is war, and there is a promised offspring who is going to suffer some damage. But ultimately, the promised offspring is going to bring victory and crush the head of the Satan the serpent, the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, gives a similar vision to which we have in the first book of the Bible. In generation 12, verse 4, John receives a vision in which he sees a dragon, okay? The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour the child. This is an echoing of what is going to happen in Genesis 3.15, that the serpent, the very old dragon, is wanting to destroy the offspring of the woman, and the woman wanting to give birth to the promised offspring to gain victory over the dragon. We have this continual warfare where the dragon, the serpent, wants to exterminate or else adulterate and corrupt the promised offspring. At the very beginning, the first offspring of Adam and Eve, Cain murders Abel, right? And Abel was the promised offspring, right? So what happens? She gives birth to Sheth, Seth. Then before the flood, it says that the people were coming more and more godless throughout their generations. They're intermarrying. They're becoming godless. God preserves them, believing Noah and his family to be righteous. After the flood, we see the serpent trying to destroy again the promised seed. God promises Abraham that Abraham's family is going to have a seed that is going to bless all nations. What happens? Sarah is infertile. She can't have a baby. She's 100 years old. Through a miracle of God, she has Isaac. And then Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, can't have a baby. She's young. 
And through a miracle of God, she is able to have offspring, Esau and Jacob. These attacks always try to prevent this promised offspring. At the time when Israel was in Egypt, the wicked Pharaoh tried to wipe out the baby boys of Egypt. This wasn't just Pharaoh being nasty and trying to control things. Behind Pharaoh stands the power of the serpent, the dragon, trying to wipe out the promised seed. We have Saul. If you remember Saul in the Old Testament, who was the first king right before King David, he's a weird character. He really is a weird character. Throughout the whole thing, if you read it, and I've I've read it at least nine times, probably more than that since I did some studying on it, he's always a weird character. He he just is a weird guy. There's no other way to really explain it. But remember how an evil spirit was troubling him and he tried to spear David and it almost seems like he's out of his own body. Remember he says, I repent of what I try to do to you. I shouldn't have done that. Even because David was always doing what is faithful and good for Saul. He never wanted to be king. At, you know, He was always loyal to Saul. He said, I would never kill you. He even had the chance and he didn't take it. Saul was trying to kill David At one level, we say, yeah, well, Saul was a little off in the head. And he didn't want David to inherit the throne. That was real. So why did he want to kill him? The evil spirit of the dragon, the serpent, was trying to kill David because through David would come the promise of the seed. Later on, in the time of the wicked king Ahab, there was intermarriage between Ahab line and the line of God, that King David stretching back to Jehoshaphat who was a godly king, let his son marry a daughter of the wicked king Ahab and Jezebel. And the daughter, Athaliah, eventually went on to try to wipe out the whole line, including some of her own grandchildren, in order to make herself king, queen. So you may think she's a horrible woman. She probably was. But more than that, she is doing the work of the serpent. She is trying to wipe out the seed of the promise. But God provided a godly priest to hide one baby from David's line. That baby was kept safe. And when he got a little older, that baby was brought out into the open as a boy and announced to be the offspring of David and Athaliah. Athaliah was seized and killed. And so the attempt of the serpent to wipe out the line of promise failed again. She tried to wipe out David's royal line, but she failed Later on, during the book, the time of Esther, a little over 400 years before Jesus, maybe 450 to 350 BC, we read about Haman, who was an enemy of God's people. He was so furious at Mordecai, a Jewish man, for not bowing down to him, that he tried to wipe out all the Jewish people. He got an order from the emperor of Persia to wipe out the Jews. But unknown to him, the emperor of Persia, the king, was married to a woman who was a Jew, Queen Esther. Uh Uh-oh. Through her, God saved the Jewish people from being exterminated. So again, you see the offspring of the serpent trying to wipe out the promised offspring who would bring salvation. I mean, it's funny because when you read all these different things, you think all people are just evil, but you can see the attack on Jesus' line over and over and over and over. It's kind of interesting. And then we find that during the time, not actually recorded in our Bibles, it's it's a part of history. During the time of Maccabees, a vicious ruler called Antichus Epiphanes, I don't speak Greek. (laughs) It's kind of foreshadowing the Antichrist. He tried to destroy Jewish people by killing many of them and intermingling with them with a lot of pagan thought. All this was the serpent trying to wipe out the promised seed. And it obviously came to a head as a promised one was literally about to be born from a particularly holy woman who was the fulfillment of all the dreams of God's people. That was the Virgin Mary. She was about to give birth to the Savior of the world. What happened? Herod tried to kill all the newborn babies because he wanted the newborn Messiah who was born in Bethlehem, the city, the city of David, to be dead. Now again, Herod the Great was a very vicious, evil, wicked man, right? We have a lot of stuff in history about him. He was not a nice man, but it's not just a human thing. When you consider the history of Herod, Herod was not just Herod. He was a particularly 
disgustingly evil man. Herod was somebody who was dominated by Satan. Herod was doing Satan's work when he tried to wipe out the baby Jesus before Jesus could even grow up and offer himself for the world. The devil came to Jesus in the desert and tempted him again and again. Rather than continue serving God the Father, Satan one-hitted him to serve him. That warfare that keeps coming up. The devil can even come to you through a close friend. And this one, I hope we all know. Peter, who had just finished confessing that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and Jesus talked about that he was going to have to suffer and die. What does Peter say? No, 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 that will never happen. You can't let that happen, Jesus. What did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. The serpent was trying to turn Jesus away from his mission. But in the end, finally, when Satan was unable to prevent Jesus from going on with his mission, Satan is his own frenzy of hatred and anger entered Judas's heart, and Judas betrayed Jesus. He corrupted the priesthood. He corrupted Annas and Sophias. He corrupted the government of the Romans, Pilate, and they gave him false trials to convict him of crimes that they knew he didn't commit, that Jesus was innocent, but they still sentenced him to death. And he was struck with the worst sin, the worst betrayal in the history of the world, the serpent struck Jesus even with death itself. And it might seem that the prophecy had not worked, that the serpent had been the one to crush the head of the promised seed because he had killed him. But Jesus paid the full price of sin by his death, and he rose from the dead. He crushed Satan's head by rising from the dead. He took Satan's own weapons, the worst sin ever committed and the worst death ever suffered, and he used those weapons which bruised his own heel to crush Satan's head. And you might think, well, a lot of people were crucified. A lot of people had horrible deaths. A lot of people in history have died horrible deaths. I remember, I used to think this when I was a child. I used to think, well, it was a horrible death, but it could have been the worst death. But when we realize that God is one and a part of God died for us, the perfect being, the Holy One, He died for us. That is why the death is so important. That is why it was the worst death of all time. Said the world shook and quaked. Creation knew that its creator had died. This promise of Genesis 3.15 is revealing to us a main thread that runs all the way through the Bible through the Old Testament, through the life of Jesus Christ, and even in his death and his resurrection, is fulfilled in Jesus' triumph over Satan. Satan and his offspring try to destroy the woman's offspring by adulterating the offspring. But it's important to understand that as you're reading the whole Bible, Genesis 3.15 is one of those big picture verses which helps us to understand what's going on behind the scenes. The story continues. The scripture is closed, right? The Bible is finished being written, but God continues to work, and Satan continues to work as well. The gospel is unchanging. It has been fulfilled. Jesus, is, Jesus fulfills God's promises. Salvation comes through faith in him. People before Jesus were looking ahead at the promised seed and receiving salvation through faith in God's promise. We look back, we know the fulfillment, we know all God has done in Jesus. We're much more privileged than those who came before Jesus who simply had that promise of an offspring but couldn't know everything God was going to do. But we can trust in the full, unchanging gospel. The promise is to you and your children, to all who are off afar, and it says in Acts chapter 2, God promises are for all believers and for their children from generation to generation. God still has an intergenerational plan. God's work is not finished yet. He plucks people from the evil grip of Satan, and he wants us to believe in him and transmit that faith and love to our children, to generation to generation. Satan, though mortally wounded and doomed to hell, still tries to wipe out God's people, exterminate them. He still tries to corrupt and tempt and swallow them up, by adulterating us. And so we need to be aware of this warfare and live with the full knowledge 
and be ready to resist him. To be able to stand against the persecutions he sends. Those persecutions are intense in some part of the world while Satan still harms and even kills people. His temptations, not just persecution, but temptations of ease and wealth and wickedness. Those are ways in which he tries to adulterate and corrupt God's people today. The dragon became furious with the woman. He's furious because the woman has given birth to the promised offspring and the offspring has triumphed. He can't touch Jesus anymore. He has won. Jesus is enthroned with all power in heaven forever. The devil can't do what he wants to do. In Revelation, all this is summarized in a single passage. It says, The woman this, not just Mary, but of the people of God, the one from above who is our mother, and the Bible says as well. Mary, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. There's a lot of history in those couple of verses. It doesn't go into all the details of what happened throughout the Old Testament history of Satan trying to swallow up the seed. All it says is she gave birth to a son and he snatched up to God and his throne. And that victory, the defeat for Satan, was a victory for the seed and a defeat for the dragon, the serpent, the great dragon, will be thrown down. The deceiver of the whole world was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him as a result of what Jesus had done. And so, when things get bad or good, we sometimes think that, G that Satan is winning. But the Bible indicates that the devil is filled with fury because he knows he's been beaten. And he knows that his time is short. So why was Jesus born? We often reflect on a variety of reasons, but one of the major reasons that Jesus was born is to destroy the devil and his work. In Hebrews, since the child, since the children of flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He was born in our humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were born, who all their lives were held by slavery, by fear, and by death. The Son of God came to destroy the devil. He had other purposes, but the biggest one was to crush the head of the serpent and in doing so release us from his grip. This is the message of Revelation 12. So when we think about the promised offspring in the very first part of the Bible, God is giving us the basic outline of what he's going to do. The unchanging gospel from the very beginning. Salvation has always been through faith in God, God's promise of a victorious offspring. He had an intergenerational plan throughout the Toledot, the generations and genealogies of Genesis throughout all the Bible. His salvation plan stretches from history, generation to generation. And so genealogies matter. The generations of God, of Jesus, they matter. The fact that God promised us and our children matter. And thirdly, this continual warfare throughout the Old Testament era, throughout the career and ministry of Jesus on earth and his death and he tried to lay a finger on Jesus, but he couldn't, and that's why he's furious. He's going to take out his fury against Jesus, on the fury that he had against Jesus, on the rest of the woman's offspring who try to do the commandments of God and hold the testimony. So, as we wrap up here, I want you to know that there are special targets for Satan in our world today. One particular target is still the Jewish people, right? And, you know, it's funny because... Um, I know the statistics say, this is a real statistic, you are 14 times more likely to experience racism as a Jewish person than any other race. 14 times. You, and it's funny because I've always thought of Jewish people as almost white people. I, I just, I don't really separate them from myself. I mean, they are the same color as me, you know, that's what, anyways. Uh, but there is a lot of anti-Semitism out there. Go online, go on any kind of forum website. There's going to be a lot of anti-Semitism when you're talking about any politics, money. It, it's weird. It honestly is weird. And why is that? Because Satan hates them. They gave birth to Messiah. They are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were chosen by God long ago for the purpose that God came to earth, shining through him and bringing the birth of the Messiah. 
Still, Satan hates the Jews, partly for Jesus' sake. And unfortunately, some foolish and wicked people calling themselves Christians throughout history have persecuted the Jews from time to time. That is the work of Satan, not the work of Jesus Christ. Satan hates the Jews. The Holocaust is the attack of Satan. The anti-Semitism and other attacks of the Jews today are the work of Satan. Another group that Satan targets is simply babies. Satan is made happy by the most vile atrocities imaginable, and he seeks to make those things a reality. In the Garden of Eden, before they were ever driven out, God had a promise of an offspring to the woman. This was before the fall. Satan hates babies because he knows that the woman, that the offspring of the woman had been cause of this downfall. And it reminds him of the promised offspring who was born as a baby. And so when you see millions of babies being aborted, murdered, before they can even be born, do not think that this is a great liberation for women or some great advance in culture. This is Satan's hatred of babies and his deception of people into thinking their lives would be better off if they killed their own children. Babies are special targets of Satan. Millions upon millions of them are murdered each year in our world. We must recognize this as the work of Satan. And thirdly, of course, a group of Satan hates above all is God's elect. He hates Christians. He hates those who stand against him, who carry on the name and the victory of Jesus. The Bible says that he overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So we are not going to defeat, be defeated by Satan. We will overcome him by the blood that Jesus shed for us. And by the word, we testify to him, about him. If you say religion is a personal thing, that's private. I don't talk about it. That's not what the Bible says. What does it say? We testify about him. It'll often excuse, the world will often excuse attacks on Jews, babies, and Christians, even when it is trying to be open-minded when it's trying to defend various group interests, you'll find that people who claim to be the greatest tolerance will often let Bible-believing Christians be mocked, and they may even do some of the mocking. They claim to be defenders of the weak, and they are championing, championing the abortion of babies. The world often excuses attacks on Satan's special targets because, as the Bible says, we are the child of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The worldlings, which do not acknowledge Jesus' victory, are still under the control of the evil one. And they have special targets where, Jesus, where Satan's hatred flows through them in targeting others. So, this verse that we read, Genesis 3.15, helps us understand the Bible. It helps us understand our own time, and it helps us understand the hatred of Satan for us. At the same time, the victory we have in Jesus Jesus said before he went to the cross, now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all of the people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Jesus' death did not take him by surprise. He knew the prophecy that his heel would be bruised when he went to the cross. But he knew that the prophecy that he would crush the serpent's head, and he came to bring judgment on the so-called ruler of the earth, and he told his disciples the night before he died, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said to them that same night, if the world hates you, you know that they hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own because you are not of the world. I have chosen you out of the world. The world hates you. Remember, the word I have said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. If they hated Jesus, the seed of the woman, they will hate you for believing in Jesus, the seed of the woman. Jesus also gave warnings to those who were serpents' offspring. Jesus told people who were religious, who were ethically Jewish, ethnically Jewish, sorry. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and you will do his will of whatever your father desires. Jesus would speak to the seed of the serpent. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. 
and your heart is dominated by Satan's seed. You serpent, you brood of vipers, how are you trying to escape being sentenced to hell? Now, Jesus didn't say these things out of hatred. He was calling many and warning them so that they would repent and become children of God, that they would become seed of the promise by faith in Jesus Christ. And still today, Jesus gives promises, and those who remain through the mouth of Jesus Christ, through the mouth of Jesus' apostle Paul, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Remember that the serpents whose head is going to be crushed, I have given you authority to tread on scorpions, serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's what he says. At the very end of the Bible, it says, the devil is cast out into the lake of fire and brimstone. That is the end of the serpent. And that is how the end of all who await, who belong to the devil. At the end of the time, Jesus will say, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the destiny of the serpent and his offspring. But the destiny of the Bible, but the destiny of the righteous is to tread on the head of the serpent and to live forever with God and his new creation. The last two chapters of the Bible bring us right back to the first two chapters, the paradise, the garden of God to the tree of life, to the wiping away of all tears, and to the renewing of all creation. The gospel that God reveals already in Genesis 3.15 then unfolds through the rest of the scripture. And we must study God's word to know it. I hope this sermon helped you a little bit understand the gospel is one. Let us keep that wonderful, victorious, big picture in mind when we celebrate the res resurrection of Jesus Christ this Easter. Father, from the, from the very beginning, we were destined to be children of you, God. God, we love you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you rose. Because as I said, without the resurrection, we are to be pitied. God, you are God, you are all-powerful, and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So what? Now what? So this week we went over the resurrection, right? And over Genesis 3.15 and how that intergenerational plan flows throughout the Bible. We will study next week a book that was very difficult from the beginning because it is one of the only two books that doesn't mention God at all. And it's in the Bible. How, how can that happen? So throughout history, well, throughout early history, when they were deciding the canon of the Bible, it was very... Uh, <laughs> my father will be doing that. So thank you for being part of the steeplest church family. We love you, and we'll see you next week.